Well, as you know, I, I'm a semiconductor physicist and at the moment I'm working on graphene and graphene transistors and enjoying that. But uh, whenever I, I, I have a holiday or a weekend, especially if it's a rainy weekend or a rainy bank holiday, I tend to start look at reading books about cosmology. And I've just been reading uh, the proceedings of a bunch of conferences. Well, we think about our universe uh, uh, as consisting of our planet, of course, going around the solar system, the solar system being centred on the sun, and the sun being a fairly modest star in our galaxy, and the galaxy can contain something like about, if I remember correctly, something like nearly 100 billion stars. And we see that as the Milky Way, of course. And then the night sky, if we know where to look and have got a sharp eyes and the sky is dark, we can see the, another uh, galaxy like ours, that's the Andromeda galaxy. And in fact, the Andromeda galaxy and our galaxy, which we call the Milky Way, are parts of our group of galaxies, our local group of galaxies. And then, if we look further out with big telescopes, we can see more and more distant uh, galaxies. Of H is 30 feet. Bottom half Sorry. of keel, scooter, and inertial. 31. There it is, scooter. Okay. Going back to, to when the universe was much, much younger, because, of course, it takes time for light to get from those very distant galaxies to us, and so we're seeing our universe at a much earlier stage. But there are ideas with the, this idea of that the universe is now ex expanding due to the presence of dark energy, or if you want to call it the cosmological constant, that that was Einstein's biggest blunder, and I think we've done some stuff on that already in 60 Symbols and so on. The, the idea of uh, this space expanding, and in particular the very rapid expansion of space, in, inflation in, in the, at the very, very early stages of our universe, this idea of inflation has led to the idea that other inflations can happen beyond our own observable universe. So we've got other universes blowing up and there may be uh, an infinite number of these and they may be quite different from the universe in which we live. And that means different in the sense that, well, an extreme example, they may, may not contain electrons and protons, though that's very hard to imagine. Maybe they would just contain dark matter, which is very mysterious to us. We have it in our universe, but we don't really know what it is. It's not like, it's not protons or electrons, that's for sure. So we've got that dark matter. You could imagine universes made out of dark matter or maybe just made out of black holes, which, where all the matter's kind of being compactified and doesn't really exist as electrons anymore. So that would be a strange universe to us. So cosmologists are suggesting we are only one of a large and possibly an infinite number of other universes, and that whole subset is sometimes called the multiverse. Though, of course, the universe should contain everything, but the universe they, means one, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, but universe, but the multiverse is a very clever name that there are lots of universes out there. And probably, at least with, you know, with our present understanding of physics and with our experimental techniques and our telescopes, we have no possibility at all of ever uh, knowing anything about these uh, universes. So people then argue, hardcore physicists, um, would then argue, I think, that, well, look, if, if we can have a chance to observe them, they're outside science because we can't do any experiments with them. But, of course, you can't really do very many experiments with pretty much all of our universe. We can only observe it, but we, observing it is sufficient for us to get uh, information about it. So like, the most recent discovery being the discovery of dark energy, uh, which is causing the universe apparently to expand uh, at an ever-increasing rate. There's a wonderful chapter in the book I mentioned uh, by Martin Rees where he describes what he calls in, uh, aversion therapy, that if you're afraid of uh, big tarantulas, then you start off putting a little spider on your hand and then a bigger one, and eventually you, know, you might be able to put up with a tarantula on your hand, something like that. And uh, the, the, I think he's quite enamoured with the idea of multiverses. In fact, he, I guess he's one of the big proponents of it. Um, and his idea is that and it's quite a valid point that he makes, is that at the time of, Gal before Galileo, we had a, a much more restricted view of the universe. Before him, we, you know, there was a whole period for a couple of thousand years that we thought that the, the Earth was the centre of the universe. Uh, and then experimental observational astronomy started and people took a, a more enlightened view and we had a heliocentric view of the universe. People like Kepler and so on and, and, and Newton built on that. But even so at that period, even in, until large telescopes were, were made, one had no idea of what galaxies were. So we were very much restricted to, 
to something perhaps a bit bigger than the solar system, the solar system or the nearby stars. But eventually we realized there were other galaxies beyond us. But of course, I already mentioned the point that if we had, with our biggest telescopes, we, are, we, are, we simply, we're probably, if we made telescopes a bit bigger, we'd be able to probe further back in time towards near to the Big Bang and see more distant galaxies. They're just too far away at the moment because they're too dim for us to see properly. So we could imagine at the moment that we're limited, we simply can't see those galaxies because they're too dim, but they still exist and they're consistent with the model that we've developed. Now, but of course, at the present time, even if we could suddenly spend tens of billions of pounds by rather wasting in all these other stupid projects like uh, uh, wind, wind turbines, for example, we maybe ought to invest it in, in, in big telescopes and then we could probe, probe deeper. But even then, even with bigger telescopes, there would be parts of our universe that we could not observe but simply because not enough time has elapsed for the light to travel from those distant and unobservable galaxies to reach us by the present time. But if we wait for another 50 years, we'll see a few more, we wait another 100 years. So, and again, those are part, those are subjects of physics. I mean, it's perfectly reasonable. So this is Reese's idea that you can use this aversion therapy and probe deeper and deeper and even think about things you haven't seen yet. But this will never happen with the multiverse. Well, that, 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 that's, that's prob probably right. But, but we, could, we could ask questions about, because we know something about the creation of our universe. We think we understand that pretty well now. There's a big bang and... Uh, we, ha we, ha we had inflation uh, and then gravity started slowing everything down and then we, we realised that the cosmological constant is there as well. It wasn't Einstein's biggest blunder after all. He introduced it uh, and then he decided he didn't want it. But now it does look as if there's that, that or something like it is causing the accelerated expansion of the universe. You always seem to me like quite a practical scientist. You like you like experiments, you like the hands-on stuff, you like evidence. Why do these multiverses capture your imagination so much when these things, are, you know, there's no experiment to be Well, done. I think if people have been watching these programs, they, they, they know about my obsession with the fine structure constant, which is one of the fundamental constants of nature. And of course, the fine structure constant, shall I write it down? This is equal to the square of the charge of the electron over... 4 pi epsilon naught. This, is, this bit is pretty boring and I could combine it with that. So I'll just put that around brackets, but it should be there in, in, in the SI units that we employ. And then we've got Planck's constant, and then we've got C in the denominator. And the value of this, as we know, is 137.03599. And then I can't remember. It doesn't go on for nines forever, but something like that, but to a good approximation, it's 1 over 137. That fine structure constant is telling us the ratio between the strength of the electronic charge and Planck's constant. The other interesting constant, we take the mass of the proton and divide that by the mass of the electron. That gives me another constant, which is 1836.15, I think, dot, dot, dot. So that's very important. Now, both of these constants, the because, to have chemistry as we understand it and biochemistry and maybe even life as we understand it, the values of those constants are quite important. Now there are some other constants of course that are very important as well. There's gravity. Now it's not the gravity on, on the surface of the earth which is just 9.8 times 9.8 meters per second per second. It's big G or Newton's constant which is much more general and which we can apply not just to the gravity on the earth but you know, the gravitational pull between the, the, between the Earth and, and, and the Moon and, and the pull of the Sun on the Earth. So big G is another very important constant. And there are a bunch of other constants. I mean, the fine structure constant is the, is the constant relating to uh, electrical charges and electromagnetism. But there are other forces in nature, like the weak interaction, so the weak fine structure constant as well, the weak interaction fine structure constant. And the things that hold, um, the strong forces that hold nuclei together and the quarks and the gluons and so on, things that make the protons. We've got the strong force as well. So we've got, in addition to that, we've got alpha weak, we've got alpha strong interaction, and there are various other things, that parameters that we have to put into the standard model of particle physics. And then the other one I'd like to write down, so if we look at all of these, the other one is the cosmological constant, which itself is very interesting. And that is the thing that um, the astronomers have discovered by looking at the supernovae in very distant galaxies. They, from this, they deduce that the universe is, is beginning to expand away and getting rap more and more rapidly expanding as well, because this thing will eventually overpower the gravitational attraction that's, 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 that's been tending to hold back the universe.
since the time of the Big Bang. So we've got a whole suite of constants now. I haven't written them all down, but there's the, the, the electrical fine structure constant. Let me put an E on that. Electromagnet, I should put electromagnetism fine structure constant. So that's the electromagnetic fine structure constant, uh, which by the way, it does change with energy and length scale. That's just its low energy value. Uh, we've got the proton to electron mass ratio. Uh, we've got big G, Newton's constant, which determines the strength of gravity. And we've got the cosmological constant, and we've got these other constants for the strong and weak interaction and other parameters in, in the standard. So we've got, so we got all these, and so we know them. And, and you, can, you can look up a standards textbook and look up their values, and there they are in our universe. Now, of course, the fascinating idea about, about the multi is, well, fascinating, fascinating idea in our universe is why do the constants have the value, values that we ha they have? And we don't have, we don't really have a, a theory for that. I mean, we can work out the, the proton-electron mass ratio by putting in the parameters in the standard model, but we've had to, you know, those parameters, are bit, if you like, that we just have to deduce them from measurement. Most importantly, they are very, very important for the existence of, li of life, for the existence of rocky planets and stars and so on. They've got to have values which are quite critical to that. And then for uh, the synthesis of larger uh, nuclei, atomic nuclei in stars, they're important for that, and even the synthesis of heavy elements in the in, in the Big Bang, important for that too. So all of these things, are, they they really determine the the universe in which we live. So then you can ask the question that if there are other universes out there, are those values constant? And according to string theory, which I don't ask me there, we've got string experts you, here you can go and talk about. But according to string theory, those constants could be different in a different. Big Bang scenario in another universe. Uh, and as far as I can tell, from what I've read, it's perfectly possible that some of these particles that are really important to us might not even exist in another universe. There's another, there's also a very interesting thing about the cosmological constant, which, which is fascinating. We've only known it's there really for the last, experimentally for the last decade, and some smart theoreticians were talking about it. And of course, Einstein dreamt it up, but we didn't really know how big or how small it was. And it turns out, of course, to be worryingly, extremely worryingly small. Because if you do a back of the envelope calculation and work out what the energy of the vacuum is, this pressure that's pushing the university, uh, the university apart, the uni if we, sorry, I always say university. Because if we do a, a, a back of the envelope calculation to estimate what the strength of the cosmological constant, or perhaps I should say more strictly, the dark energy, which is kind of equivalent to it. Uh, the back of the envelope calculation gives us an answer that's the biggest uh, miscalculation in all of science, because it's not out by a factor of 10, or a factor of 100, or 1,000, which is 10 to the third, or 10,000, which is 10 to the fourth. That back of the envelope calculation is out by a factor of 10 to the power 120. Now, you can massage that down to values, smaller values, maybe 10 to the 60 by doing slightly different theories. But basically, we do not know why it has the value that it has, because at the present time, it's actually fairly close to the density of all the rest of the stuff, ordinary matter like us and the dark matter. Um, but it's also just about, at, at the, the value that it has is just about big enough for us to observe it at the present time using our present technology. And that seems, you know, it seems, so it's a kind of double, why is it so small? And it's rather strange, it's got the value that it has for us to observe right now. Which, but there we are. So nobody really knows why it has the value it has. Which brings me back to the multiverse, because in other universes within this multiverse, the cosmological constant or the dark energy could be much bigger. So the universe will rip apart even before galaxies have time to form, even before stars have time to form. So no stars, no planets. No galaxies would mean no us. And, you know, that would be a, a universe which we would find very hard to, to, to think of in terms of life existing. So that's an interesting thing. That could, could be different. And if the fine structure constant or, or the proton-electron mass ratio were different, then, you know, we, we, we wouldn't have the kind of universe that, that we've got. If the strong interaction would be were too strong, you'd have diprotons forming, for example, rather than having the types of uh, atomic nuclei that we have in our universe. So there are lots of uh, interesting questions. Why are the constants? So why are the fundamental constants down at the microscopic level, the fundamental particles, down to the smallest length scales that we can measure, uh, going right up to the strength of the gravitational constant and the, and, and the cosmological constant? 
those could be different, and we have no idea why they have the values they have at present in our universe. I can understand why you have this fascination with these constants as they apply in our universe, but again, a pragmatist like you, knowing that almost by definition we will never get to observe these multiverses, these other, these other ones, it just seems like a philosophical debate. Hmm, I wonder what it would be like if they had different numbers. And we'll never know, we'll never see. It's almost like just like, a, it's just like dreaming to me. And that doesn't seem your style. But I think all, all, all physicists have the idea that there is out there a theory of everything, that if we try harder, we maybe will... I mean, I, I'm not sure this... I mean, the multiverse scenario probably argues this is not the case, but I think a lot of us, part of us, these, these sort of hard-headed rationalist, uh, reductionist fig, uh, physicists would, uh, would, would like to think that um, we can get... we can understand better why some of these constants have the value that they have. Uh, or at least understand more clearly how they're all linked together. And in particular, perhaps understand how we can combine um, the, the strong and the weak and the electromagnetic interaction with gravity. I mean, that's one of the big challenges of phys physics, to get a good theory of quantum gravity and to see how all these forces come together. And maybe even to see how they link to the cosmological constant or the dark energy. So. I, I, I suppose asking these questions about why they have the values they have is this idea of reductionism, that we can get a much more thorough um, idea of, of how the universe works and why the constants have the values that they have. But at the same time, thinking about those constants makes me, and knowing that there are these string models which are addressing these problems, these string models are predicting that other universes could be could exist. We could be. We could have these inflation and inflationary cosmology that these universes can just inflate out of vacuum fluctuations. Um, I guess makes us think about other possible values of the of the, of the fundamental constant. And of course, that these so-called anthropic principle as well comes in. That why the universe has the constants. That so I suppose the multiverse. I mean, there's an interesting controversy here. I mean, does the does? I mean, I'd like to think that the. Multiverse, if it's, it, it sort of removes God, which I'm quite happy to, to push him in as much out of the way. I hate the idea of metaphysics coming into physics. Um, so I'm rather attracted to the multiverse scenario because it pushes those two things further apart. But I believe there are people who think, I mean, there, there are philosophers, for example, who believe that the multiverse uh, would actually be some argument for, for some huge supernatural being. I don't know why they think this. Maybe they think that if he's so supernatural, he's got to have lots of universes to work with rather than, he's, you know, there's not enough to do in this universe, though goodness knows there seems enough. <laughs> if, if we're somebody useful around to sort out all the problems we've got, uh, that might be a good thing. So I, I don't like metaphysics at all. Um, so I, I, it, it, multiverses attract me for that reason as well, I suppose. Short of conferences and people writing papers and talking about it, what's next then? What is the Holy Grail or what's the... What's the big thing that will take the f multiverses to the next level? Well, uh, I, I don't really know. I mean, the observational problem is, is serious. I mean, the string theory and superstrings have been around for 20 years. There are some really interesting textbooks by practitioners, you know, people who really know they're, what they're talking about, not amateurs like me in, in this field. Uh, who, who, you know, who, who are very sceptical about all the effort that's gone into string theory because it hasn't produced anything tangible. There are so many possible solutions that you can get out of string theory that that may not provide the answers that we want. It's a matter of opinion, right? My, my personal opinion is that, that the reality of things requires there to be some test that somebody could do in order to actually show that there is a, you know, that this, the, 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 this thing you've hypothesized actually has some consequences for other things. But they were precisely the same, and then they diverged when this quantum event occurred. So there's sort of all sorts of universes sitting on top of each other, and they're splitting apart and differentiating as time goes on.